Okay, we're going to start right up. Thank you all for joining us. And wow, in this time when we, uh, as ESL teachers, frequently love our travel and can't get out there, we are excited to see people from all across North America. We have DC, Minnesota, New Jersey, North Carolina, California, Virginia, Illinois, Maryland, Washington, West Virginia, New York, uh, and then British Columbia, Vancouver, and Langley, and also someone joining us from Morocco today. And today we're going to focus on family and community wellness. So previously we focus on social emotional wellness on one of our previous webinars, and today we want to focus on physical health and all ongoing learning. So a combination of, of mental and physical health and for summer 2020. So our summer times might be looking a little different than we um, than our typical summers. And so we want to be responsive to that and, and hope you're all well and um, continue to be safe and healthy. And our archived webinars, as, as we mentioned, um, you will find on each one of these titles, if you click on the title, you will find the YouTube recorded version of this webinar and then linked below as sub bullets, you see the handouts, sometimes the handout packet or various uh, pages from our webinar that we would like to reference for you and for your participation in that topic area. So as I mentioned, we have about 12 or 15 of these and they're on the cal.org website under free resources tabs. So as always, we have our introductions and we know this summer is looking a little different and our school year has looked a little different this year in terms of how we've been able to uh, reach our students and um, meet the needs of our English learners in particular. So let's think about the summer and what is what image is kind of speaking to you right now when you look ahead to your summer? How is it looking? How are you feeling about upcoming summer? So these are um, all of all of us at Cal who've been uh, putting these webinars together, as well as our colleagues. I know Chelsea participated in one, Chelsea Lafferty, and our colleagues Marilyn, Raphael, and Lisa Tabaku. We've all been coordinating, um, but Mary Bell, Kate, Maria, and I have been your team here on Friday afternoons. And so I guess I'll just share what what the pictures that have been resonating with us. So. Uh, Mary Bell's looking forward to relaxing a bit like that dog in the hammock. Um, I'm, I chose this, the rainbow one, um, not because things are dark and cloudy, but just that I feel like the light is coming and I'll just continue to follow that rainbow with hope. And Maria is feeling a little bit like she dropped her ice cream cone. Um, yeah, for summer living in DC for her and um, yet so much is closed. And then uh, Kate is optimistic in picking those dandelions and making her wishes. Hopefully, it not, seems like we'll have hopefully an opportunity to do some of the relaxing and enjoy some of the blue skies this summer. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Mary Bell, now to take us through our next section. Okay, so welcome everybody. Glad to have you here. Um, the agenda doesn't look too long, but there is a lot of information there today and we're going to talk about you know our health our wellness we're going to talk about reading writing listening and speaking and it looks like we're going to be challenging you guys to your own personal olympics since the olympics this summer has been postponed for another year so let's take a look at what we're talking about and quickly put, you know, being uh, good PSYOP teachers as we are, we always have content and language objectives. As you can see, we're planning on presenting and brainstorming resources and activities that you can take back to your schools, back to your homes, share with parents, share with colleagues. And we want you to really be part of the, the talking and the chatting on how do we promote, you know, physical and mental wellness through language rich, because we're really focusing on really developing that language, not just for English learners, but for all our students. So as we go on, we want to take a look first on how do we keep in shape for the summer. I'm not a big exercise person, so I want to get this one out first and stop and think about how are we going to keep in shape. I'm more like that little guy in the middle there, you know, dreaming about the muscles. 
So let's go on. And one of the things we want to do is we are challenging you to the language Olympics. I have my friends here uh, from Hanna-Barbera from the Laugh Olympics, and I'm calling these the language Olympics. And here's your challenge. We have actually these categories, five categories that we are challenging you, your students, your own children, your own families with for the summer. And we would like you to do something like a scavenger hunt where you're going to be looking for how to fulfill these activities. And we're going to be reviewing these with you. So one of the things you can do is they, uh, you can create Olympic ribbons. We actually have in your handouts a large ribbon that your kids can color in. And the way you color it is if you're able to do eight of these activities, you get a gold medal. If you do six of the activities, you get a silver medal. And if you can at least do four of these throughout the summer, you'll get a bronze medal. So let's start with our first part, which is healthy mind and body events. Now, this is about a scavenger hunt that my colleague Maria actually helped uh, find these links. Can you help us out, Maria? Yes, I would love to. So uh, we've been showing different ways to uh, use uh, digital tools, and this is just another way using Google Forms. Um, I created two different examples over here. So on the left, uh, when you go to that form, you'll see that I did it without sections because, and I didn't require any of the events to happen um, because you, you know when you're out in your neighborhood and you're looking for different activities to do. Uh, you might do them out of order. And so if you're going to do this with your family, I put a start date and then the time that you started and then some fun ideas. So a fire hydrant, take a slide, uh, take a selfie next to the uh, recycling bin, take a photo of someone riding a bike and upload the photo. And so once you have all of these items done, then you can um, time stamp it and then have like a competition between different family members uh, some, you know, this summer, not everybody can get together depending on where you live. And, um, and so this gives an opportunity to either do it uh, with the whole family together in a summer event, or if you're separated in different locations, and then one person would be in charge to kind of uh, bring it together. The other one on the right hand side, I did in sections because sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming to do a scavenger hunt in one day and so you might want to break up um, the challenges it's the same exact challenges but you just do it one at a time and so unfortunately i put so we'll just put in something over there and then you go to the next one and then so we start the time of the day and over here we would upload it and then the next day you would go to do the next item and the next item and because I did not require each of these to go move on to the next item, then you could actually go back the next day and just uh, kick off where you were the last time or go out of order. So that's another fun way that we can have a scavenger hunt the old fashioned way and bring it to the uh, virtual world. Okay, thanks, Maria. Now, one of the things that has been happening actually since uh, the Eisenhower administration is the President's Challenge of Physical Fitness. And you can actually pick up the, the latest version of the challenge online. And what it does is that it breaks down physical fitness in four areas, physical fitness test, a health fitness test, the Presidential Active Lifestyle Award, and the Presidential champions and students can do different activities in order to gain points towards getting a medal or getting a certificate so what do these include if we can move on to the next slide we'll see that the physical fitness test is a five item fitness test designed to measure between the age uh, for students between the ages of six and 17 how to get stronger together so it's physical exercise. The health fitness test is a five item test that recognizes achievement of a healthy level of fitness. And that includes our diets. 
And one of the things they utilize to help this is the BMI, which all of us hate when we go to the doctor because they always figure that out. Then we have the Presidential Active Lifestyle Award where you're doing a combination of both physical fitness and healthy eating and you're measuring it for a six week period. Now, what are some of the activities? Well, there are certain activities that each student is expected to be able to do. Uh, you can use curl ups or partial curl ups, what they call a shuttle run and an endurance run. And there are some guidelines from ages six through seven, eight and nine, and then 10 and older. Now, these are suggestions uh, by the federal government's guidelines, but teachers and parents of course, you can adjust to what's appropriate for your kids. You wouldn't ask a 10-year-old to run the same amount of distance as a 15-year-old. And it can be an endurance walk. It does not have to be a complete run. The next events include pull-ups, flex arm, hands, or a right angle push-up. You have your choice on that one. And then they have the V, sit, and reach. Mainly, the idea is to see how far you can reach and can you get better over a certain amount of time. And all of this is put down on a form and submitted. And if you meet the criteria, your child can get a certificate from the, pres uh, from the President of the United States. It's kind of cool. I remember doing these in school myself. Uh, we used to do them as a gym class. But right now, in this virtual world, Parents can take the form, do it with their students, and then submit the forms to their teachers. So we can scan and do it on the computer and put it in. So if we go to the next slide, there's some activities that can be substituted. Jump rope, push-ups, and sit-ups are, are some examples of substitutions that can be used. Next, and then you can get the forms. This is the where you can get the uh, different forms from the federal government. And it's actually a book that you can just download and you'll be able to just uh, take the forms, fill them out, or have the, uh, let the teachers know what the students have accomplished and the teachers from their schools can submit it as a whole school document, which is kind of fun. Now, the other part of this has to do with healthy eating. Now, the food pyramid, we've all heard of it since we were kids ourselves, and it's designed to make healthy eating easier by letting people know what is it that they can eat, that they're getting the correct amount of nutrients, proteins, fats, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals that all of us need. But are we doing it all the same way? If we go on to the next slide, We'll see that here in the United States, we actually use the food pyramid, but we also use the healthy plate, which is an, another way that the US Food and Drug Administration is letting kids know what's healthy. But here's my question. Is healthy eating the same all over the world? Well, some of us got on the internet and we started looking at the food pyramids in different countries and what they look like. So the International Food Pyramid, we have one here from Ireland, which is the first one. And the second one is the Chinese Healthy Eating Pagoda. And although one of the things that I noticed was even though it's the same food categories of dairy, meat and poultry, vegetables, fruits, cereals, what the food looks like is very different in some cases. On the next page, we have several others that we are looking at. We have the French. We have the African Heritage Diet Pyramid, which is very interesting because it represents multiple countries, as well as the uh, Food Dome from Arab countries. And these are generalizations. They're not exact. They're not the same. But it's very interesting for me that even though the categories are the same, what the foods look like are a little bit different. So they're fun to take a look at and share with our children that what are people eating in different countries. If we go to the next one, we'll see that we have La Piramide de la Dieta Latinoamericana, which as you can see, the fruits and vegetables uh, may not be the ones we eat normally. 
And we've also included for our vegetarian and vegan uh, colleagues and friends and children, a diet pyramid for them. Now these come from an organization that really looks at traditional foods. It's called Old Ways. And if you go on that website, it's really interesting because they have traditional foods from all over the world and from different uh, ethnic groups. And it's really interesting to see what is it that people consider healthy and not healthy in other cultures. If we move on, one of the things that we are recommending as an activity to help, and it could be part of your scavenger hunt, is creating a family cookbook. It's a really great way to share our traditions and our customs from all of the different countries that we come from. Now, what are some of the things that it helps us? Well, it allows for number one, discussions and family member interviews. You know, uh, kids can ask their grandparents, their aunts, their uncles about their favorite foods and then collect recipes. We can share traditional foods and recipes, which is kind of fun because have, if you have two or three different people, they're gonna have two or three different ways of creating the same foods. So it leads to a lively discussion. Comparisons between American foods and traditional foods from one's cultures. Looking at that vocabulary is really important as far as ingredients, measurements. For example, I shared some recipes with colleagues from, from Great Britain. Well, their measurements are all in grams. So I had to learn how to convert uh, cups and teaspoons and tablespoons into grams of food and back and forth and how to follow step-by-step -step directions, which is something our students really need to know how to do, especially when they get into science. Uh, translations for names of foods. There are certain foods that may not have a word in English. For example, the Spanish um, word ñame, which is a root vegetable. There is no translation for it in English. So that leads to discussion. And then regarding physical development of a cookbook, how do you create it? How do you format it? How do you illustrate it? So we have some suggestions here on how to create it. This is in your handouts. You know, uh, start with family member interviews and collect information. You know, what's their favorite food? How do they create it? How do they learn to prepare it? Choosing recipes for the book, decide how many recipes you wanna put in. Which ones are you gonna put in? Which ones are you gonna illustrate or maybe take pictures of? Step three on our next slide tells us that we need to choose a recipe format. How are you gonna lay it out? As a matter of fact, there are quite a few websites that do digital ebook formats that help you. Or you could do hard copies or maybe handwritten. I'm creating one for my family that's handwritten because I really think that that's a part of myself I wanna pass on. Is it illustrated? What'll each section look like? Are you gonna do some desktop publishing maybe? And then how do you create that text? Are you writing out the ingredients, the directions, the procedures? Is it gonna be in English? Are the translations right? Or maybe it's gonna be bilingual. Maybe on the left side you do the native language and the right side you do the English. Are you gonna include some family stories in there? So that's a lot of fun and a lot of language that you're sharing with your children. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, we wanna remember, don't forget the math. Serving sizes, research on nutritional information per serving size, accurate measurements, all of this is part of the math, but it's a science and health. So you're bringing in all of these content areas. We go on and there is a sample interview in your handouts of when I interviewed my aunt about her favorite food, uh, which is pretty much is ham soup or ham bone soup. And it was a lot of fun going through the interview and what I asked her and, and the directions and the colloquialisms that she added in, which I had a kind of hard time translating back and forth. And then we have for you also a sample on our next slide of uh, different ways you can create your cookbook. Do you want to create it in cards, in tables? There are a lot of cards and card formats on the internet that you can find. These two were um, two different websites. 
on creating uh, recipes. The other one I created, uh, which is a page in order to do it for a cookbook. And I shared a, my favorite recipe. Since all Puerto Rican cooking is dependent on the sofrito, I wrote out what it would look like on a sheet from my cookbook on how to create sofrito. And that's also in your handouts. As we go on, we're going to talk a little bit more now about reading, writing, listening, and speaking with our language Olympics. So who's helping me out here? Oh, I was just wondering if this is the place where we might want to add the cook cooking class or if that's a speaking activity. Kate, Kate? do you want to? Uh, yeah, this, that's the, if, if we have the video ready, it's probably better now because I mostly yeah. did it fast forward, but let me just give a little background information. Mm -hmm. I had some trouble. I wanted to put some music in the fast forwarded sections. And so the music kind of covers the speaking at the beginning, but this is my daughter and my son joins us too. And um, my daughter wanted to make kibis. Um, my mother-in-law, my husband's family is from Somalia. And so they've watched Ayeo, their grandmother, make kibis over and over and over again. So we talked to her and got her recipe and tried our hand at making kibis together. So it was a lot of fun. And I put together this little video for you. Okay, we are going to make kibis. Okay. Kibis is kind of like a tortilla, but it's sweet and you can eat it green or you can eat it with stuff like a tortilla. Yeah, who makes kibis? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so kibitz is a flatbread that your um, Ideo makes. She's from where? Somalia. And it's a delicious flatbread that has a few layers in it. So we're going to try our best using her recipe to make some kibitz. Mm. So there you go. It was a little fast forwarded video of our 10 cent kibis, which um, it was very delicious. It was not the same as the Yegos, but we got pretty close and um, we're really looking forward to getting to see her again so we can get some pointers on making it even better next time. Um, but I did get this idea from Mary Bell's idea of making a family recipe. And um, it also is part of Zara's Girl Scout badge, so it worked out well. <laughs> That's wonderful. And I want to give a special shout out to Zara and Elias Percy, who have been our models for many activities throughout our uh, pandemic webinar series. And um, you can see how well they're doing. Um, I know it's a lot of work. And thank you to Kate. Shout out for, for doing the video editing there. and sharing your skills with us <laughs> looks really good so um yeah to continue on with our language olympics we are going to you are there's some um some of our activities that you'll see are repeated from our archived webinars and i know in our in the handout packet you have 
this full listing of um, uh, the, there's actually five activities um, from the physical health side that, that Mary Bell just went over and then uh, reading, writing, listening, and speaking activities. And uh, we purposely left the handout as a word version so that you can revise perhaps as an activity that you did with your students during the school year. Um, and you'd like to send this, you know, revise that word document and send it home with some activities of your own. Um, so of course, feel free to do that. It's also a nice summary of all the activities that we've been doing as part of our webinar series. So if you um, you know, come across one that doesn't sound familiar, uh, you can look back through some of our archive webinars or feel free to email us as well at solutions at cal.org and we can point you to the correct webinar where you'll find more about that. So a few reading ones, um, this is also in your handout, it's just very simple um, letter search. So having students walk around in their neighborhoods, kind of like that scavenger. This one is just more of a, you know, phonics activity. Um, I did this one on my own neighborhood, and so just thinking about um, what are we, you know, some of the nature, some of the establishments, some of our, I didn't put any neighbors' names, but of course you could be specific about some of the neighbors in your, in your neighborhood, community helpers, etc. This is an activity that we did in our literacy, um, which was our second webinar in this series, and just the idea, it's something that I saw um, someone doing out as so with sidewalk chalk, but in this case, having students read a, a book, short story, or your children, um, any kind of news story, and finding a meaningful quote that they want to illustrate. So it can be meaningful, it could be a quote that makes you um, think, it could be, um, you know, an idea that you oppose, so you can modify that and then um, open up the discussion about the quote and why they chose that quote, what it meant to them. So these were some of the ones that we did um, from our own. Uh, this is Kate, Maribel, and Maria's uh, quotes from their favorite um, stories, I think. And then uh, we did have Zara and Elias participate and um, we already presented these, but here we have Zara thinking about her nonfiction book on Abraham Lincoln, and she particularly liked the quote, all the ladies, um, all the ladies like whiskers, because it was related to being a girl. So um, I know Kate shared that it was important to ask a why, because otherwise she thought it was kind of an odd quote to like for a second grader. And then we have Elias in kindergarten, and um, he liked the O, oh, you know, because it was funny. And so, again, we thank them for their participation and uh, making our webinars uh, take take life. Um, another thing in your handout is um, just having starting a book club um, at Cal. You know, people are really um, you know have are in different places, and and a lot of us don't have a lot of concentration for reading. Um, so we formed a book club where we're not reading the same book. We're actually reading very different genres of books. Um, and and sometimes we don't get through our books when we, every three weeks or so when we meet. But we just have a guiding question that we discuss based on what we're reading. And it ends up being um, kind of recommendations for different books that we might like to read. And the other thing is it's just a form of connection right now. Um, and it makes me, reminds me of, uh, I remember thinking about, you know, when adults leave a movie theater or finish a book and have a book club discussion, they don't start by saying, what happened in the beginning? And then what happened in the middle? And then what happened in the end? Um, which is so often the type of book report or summary that we ask our students to do about what they read, but rather, you know, thinking of some questions like, did you think that was a believable ending? Or did you like that actor? Or um, what, what really resonated with you. So there's some questions in there to prompt discussion that could be used in a book club where, you know, you might have a first grader and a seventh grader who are reading completely different books, but able to have a conversation that's more general in terms of, for example, our next question is, which character would you like to give advice to? What advice? And then writing. So um, a few ideas, and there's also a, a handout page in, in your handouts with sample sentence frames. Of course, you can add different ones, but just these are some of the activities we thought that students could participate in this summer, uh, writing to a neighbor, or essential worker, making a brochure about your neighborhood. You know, so thinking locally about the community, creating signs, 
a letter to the editor. You know, do, do the students think they should be going back to school in the fall or what should that look like or what type of online supports would they need? Um, so uh, creating uh, the comic strip is another activity that we had done. And here's a website. There are a number. I know, you know, there's lots of drawing um, webinars going on out there, but this was one where the students would fill in the blanks. And shout out to my husband, Lance Og, for doing um, the drawing of this comic. So we really enlisted our family. I know uh, Mary Bell says she interviewed her aunt, and um, we're, we've been using these webinars for our own family and friend connections as well, um, which has been fun. And thank you for that opportunity. So um, yeah, having students uh, fill in the gaps here and, and add some some of their own ideas in, in writing. This is another activity that Maribel led us through, which is the enclosed place. We sometimes do this in our PD. Um, so thinking about, you know, if you are enclosed in a, in a place, um, and it can be anything from a state of being that's positive, like love, um, or in a realistic place, like an airplane, something really different, or you could be trapped in an ice cube. So, um, yeah, you have writer A and writer B, and you know one person loves it, one person hates it, and one is trying to convince the other to stay. And Maribel and Kate did a great example using, um, well, here's an example from a 10th grader about being inside of a box. I'll just let you scan that. And then I wanted to show you uh, Maribel and Kate who did this enclosed place through text messages. Um, thinking and we'll just let you scan that as well. Okay, so they're trapped inside a uh, cell. Is it a plant cell? Yes, chloroplast and cytoplasm. So um, using humor, but a lot of facts and vocabulary too. So something they could try. This one was a, a writing prompt that Maribel wrote us a, a, a little short story starter and um, included our staff names, but you could include your students and then have them finish the story. And of course, then they can compare. So this was a story about us on our way to a conference and she put us in a parallel situation that was spooky. <laughs> and then um, we had a few of you finish this off. So just another bringing these, some of our older, um, older ideas to the to the front as we wrap up today too. Um, writing prompts. This is something I don't know if I shared last time, but my mom, yeah, I think maybe I did that we used to have um, family writing contests that had prizes and my mom would simply put them on the fridge when we were kids and we responded. Um, you know, there was prize twizzlers usually. Um, so one of them that I remember was how did we get our last name originally? And what does it mean? So, you know, this was a creative, creative story. And um, so letter writing, any kind of journaling, we actually had some um, evening journals, I think in our social web, social emotional webinar, there was some handouts there related to um, diary entries, especially related to students, social emotional wellness and the connections and activities they're doing during this um, difficult time for them. So now I'm going to pass it off to, I believe it's Maria who's going to come back and join us for speaking. Yes, so now we're going into the speaking Olympics and we're going to share some fun games that you are probably familiar with. The first one is called charades games. And so there, uh, there are fun ways that we can use our phone and technology. If you're using guessword, it's because you're on a certain type of device uh, and then heads up is for the other. So whether you're on an iPhone or um, a different uh, Android devices and all you do is you put your, uh, you select the game, a category, and then uh, the players get to tell you um, or explain without using the actual word what it is and the and the person who's holding up the phone will have to guess what the word is. Now, a fun way that I've done this without technology is using playing cards because you get a deck of 52 cards and usually you have them laying around in your house or in your classroom or even go to the dollar store for a dollar and they're very sturdy cards. And so I had my students 
even three and four year olds love to do this. They go and look at the different uh, grocery flyers that are out there or different uh, clothing items and you just cut up the little pictures and you put the pictures there. So it's great for early literacy or, um, or even stu students who are learning a new language um, that are, you know, you don't have to have words, you can have a picture that's taped or glued to that card and uh, it's a lot of fun when you have two or three different categories on those 52 cards. Another game that we have is uh, Wheel Decide. And so this is a digital one, but you, we've talked about spinners before. In one of our sessions, we had a yoga spinner and then we had an activity spinner. Um, um, and so this one, when you go to wheeldecide.com, you can think about, um, they're already pre um, segmented or sectioned off spinners. One is a twister game. So if you lost your twister um, spinner or don't have the twister game where you put your right foot on the yellow um, a piece of paper, you know, instead of having the actual game, sometimes those games are expensive. You could just get a piece of paper or a little swatch of a, cl a cloth that you have, a fabric, and, and put that on the floor and then still have those fun times of of playing whether you're doing uh, so here's a spinner you just click on it you can also modify the spinner so if you wanted to change the activities you can uh, it has the magic eight ball so you get a lot of questions that come out and then you do the spinner whether it's yes or no uh, you, there's the flip um, flipping of the coin zodiac um, color wheel so you could talk about how chartreuse is being used and it, it's fun really to put in your different uh, questions over there and your answers and and then you can embed that into your lesson or into your email to somebody and again play with your family maybe during a video conference so that's another way that and so then we also have which kate is going to explain one of my favorite apps called chatter picks yes yeah, so chatter picks is a free app you can download to your phone um, and it's it's meant for children, so that's as a parent, that's always really important to me because sometimes free apps are a little frightening um, with just the advertisements. But Chatterpix is made for kids. Um, it's by Duck Duck Moose, which they do a lot of children's apps and activities. And basically, the kids can take a picture and then they can add a little mouth um, to the to whatever they've taken a picture of, and then they have 30 seconds to record speech as though something in that photograph that they took is talking. So one way to help guide this um, to make it a little bit more academic and language focused would be to have learners take a picture that's something related to content that they've been studying. So if it's a famous painting, they could make, you know, a part of the painting or a person in the painting talk and they may have to you know, talk about the historical period or use some vocabulary maybe that you've um, pre-taught. Um, they might, you might do something with a historical figure. Um, I'm gonna show you a video in a minute where my daughter talked about uh, George Washington on a dollar bill. Um, they might do a plant. So they could um, take a picture of a plant and have the plant talking about itself and its different features using vocabulary. Um, or for younger learners, it could be something like a shape where they would be talking as that shape and identifying the features that make um, that shape, that shape, <laughs> that form. Um, so it is, it, to make this a little more language focused, we wanna require certain words or phrases. You might provide your learner some sentence frames, or you could even give them some questions that they need to answer as that object. So let me show you a couple examples that my children did. This one is from Elias. He's in kindergarten and he's six and he's describing, he found a shape and this is his chatter pick. I'm a rectangle with four, with four sides. And, and four corners. They're not identical. Okay, so that was Elias as um, the rectangle television. And here is Zara um, yes. as George Washington and the dollar bill. Hi, George Washington, and I was the first president of the United States. I grew up on a farm in Mount Vernon with my family and I like to re, re, ride horses. 
and do other stuff. And that that gray stuff, that that gray stuff. So on my head, the hair, that's a wig. Okay, so my kids love this app. Um, so when I can get them to do something that's actually showing off a little bit more of their knowledge or making them think. Um, it's a nice way to get them into using content area language. So this is one we put on our Speaking Olympics. Um, another idea we had is uh, for have learners host a family meeting, which they could do either online or by phone. And so part of the thing that makes this a really good speaking and listening activity is the pre-planning and the organization. So they would need to plan out sending an invitation to family members, um, which they could either do via phone or they could send an email, be able to schedule the meeting and then thinking about organizing the meeting. So it's a nice idea, especially with a Zoom format when everybody gets on, you don't all want to be talking at one time and then, you know, or have nothing to say that can lead to those awkward silences. So organizing the meeting, the learner could prepare some questions and topics for discussion in advance. They could think about things that might be fun and interesting for the people who are going to be involved. And they might want to set some ground rules so that everyone has a chance to speak and listen. Um, they get a chance to be the moderator. So some of those tasks might be thinking about how they're going to welcome everybody to the meeting, ask an opening question, calling on people to answer. They might summarize what others have said. And this skill that's become very important for learners is practicing muting and unmuting. In this case, they might be muting and unmuting other speakers, but that's certainly something that they're probably grown accustomed to doing now as they're taking online classes. So I did provide a planning template for this in your handouts that just looks a little like this. So they could add lines, um, the people they want to invite, making sure they have their email address or their phone number. And then as people are getting back to them, days and times that are available so they can schedule and um, then jotting down some topic ideas. So one topic idea might be roses and thorns. So one good thing, one challenge from your week. And so when they're thinking about those topics, they should think about who's going to talk. Well, that one, maybe they want everyone to respond. And as their moder as the moderator, what's their role? They're going to explain what a rose and a thorn is. They're going to call on speakers to answer. Um, and they're going to need to mute and unmute speakers as they're sharing. And then the ground rules for this topic is that everyone must contribute and only one person can speak as a at a time. So this is a way, a fun way for learners to be able to develop those organizational and presentation skills that transfer to a lot of other things that they need to be doing in their classes. Um, another idea we had for speaking is to place an order by phone. Now, so often we are ordering things to our houses, but we're doing it either through Amazon on an app or you know Grubhub where there's pictures. This would be the challenge of really using oral language to place an order for something on the phone with a person. Um, so they need they would need to plan again. So how are you going to greet the other person? What will you say? Do you have questions about what it is you're ordering or questions for them? And then what information are they going to ask for from you? Are they going to ask for credit card information? Do you know your address and phone number? And then, of course, when we're talking with people on the phone, we want to make sure that we've understood each other. So repeating what the other person has told you and making sure that they've understood what you said. And then thinking about how you're going to end that call. So again, I've provided a planning sheet in your handouts for placing an order. And this is just a way for learners to think before they uh, they engage in that phone call. And actually it's something, if I'm making a phone call, I like to think through these things before I get on the phone with someone. So, you know, make sure they know the company and they have the phone number, they know what their order is, um, if they need ordered numbers or if they, you know, need a, just, if it's food, maybe it's just a, the name that appears on the menu. Make sure they have their address, whatever payment information they need. Um, and then for the call, we have I included some different sentence frames or starters. They might greet the person and then I would like place their order and then thinking about questions they might have. Do you have any blank or does this come in a different size or color or pattern? When can I expect my order? Um, and then checking for understanding. I heard you say, is that correct? Could you repeat my order to me? And then how they're going to close the call in a polite way. 
Um, so just another option uh, as they're checking off those speaking activities um, for their Olympic Games. And I think we are going to move on to listening now. Yes, so now we're going to be talking about listening and listening and speaking really go hand in hand. Uh, one of my favorite websites is the Voice of America Learning English or VOA Learning English. Uh, you definitely have to check out a day in photos uh, because it has photographs of uh, all over the world what's happening and then you have a discussion and then you listen to each other talk about things. We also have um, the Voice of America has news uh, reports for every single day and from other countries as well. This one happens to be from May 26, the photos that you're, you're, you're looking at. Um, like I said, these are photographs from all over the world. When you scroll down for the beginning, intermediate, or in advanced, you'll have different videos to listen to that are a minute long, two minutes long, uh, five minutes long, grammar, pronunciation, word of the day. Um, definitely check out also the voanews.com because those are news reports from specific um, continents as well as in different languages too. So those are fun things to listen uh, and read and write. So all of those literacy skills are all put together even though we're, we're kind of highlighting listening. There's a lot to do with these multimedia websites right and so that's just something that uh, we hope to, to that you check out because then you can actually see how fast is um, let me see what was that it was how fast is two shakes of a lamb's tail right and so um, definitely look at all of those uh, the next part of listening we have the audiobooks and podcasts and we're going to visit uniteforliteracy.com which is great for beginning readers or early uh, readers as well. But these are great audiobooks that are actually in English and other languages. So the, the narration is in English or Spanish as a first choice. And then you can select uh, any of 40 different languages. And so if you uh, want to hear, some, even if you're not familiar with that, uh, language, you might want to listen to Burmese or Cherokee Indian or Chickasaw or um, Kirundi, you know, different languages. And those um, readers are actually speakers of that language. And so that's nice to hear their accent and the way they uh, the pronunciate their words. And it's a nice translation of what the book is. So that's Unite for Literacy, and this is free. Uh, Storynori.com is also uh, also free audio stories that we have. We have some that are um, also turned into songs, and some are just audiobooks of all different ages, uh, mythology, fiction, nonfiction uh, stories. Um, so that's fun to to use as well. Epic is a library uh, digital library system that many schools. And many participants throughout our webinar series have pointed out, and so we're not. Uh, it's a subscription, but the AfricanStoryBook.org is a great site if you're looking for African languages. There are over a thousand storybooks with uh, hundreds of languages there, and you can um, download the books. And then using Book Creator, you can make. You can actually read the books and record your voice to it, which is nice. And these are all um, free books that you can download and use with your lessons or share with your family members, as long as you attribute that it, it came from uh, AfricanStoryBook.org. Thousands of books that are there, beautiful, uh, beautiful books. And you can, uh, you also have the ability to adapt the books and change it and the illustrations are also uh, the illustrators are from Africa so it's a great way to uh, learn about the world from a different about a different continent that we that you're on and so we're also going to be talking about uh, let me see here African storybook yes and tumble is the podcast for science of all ages which is also fun. 
So there are a lot of other podcasts that if you have Spotify, uh, there are pod uh, podcasts for children as well. And these are great uh, stories to listen to. My daughter is 25 and that's how she gets all of her news is through podcasts. And so uh, sometimes students just want to listen uh, in, instead of have the visual because they're always uh, in some kind of technology. And so it's a nice relief just to use one mode of language instead of uh, have all, everything uh, bombarded at the same time. So it's nice to just turn off the you know the, you know, close your eyes and listen to the story and relax your eyes for a little bit um, so those are great different tales that are short uh, some are short and some are longer um, audio podcasts I have asked about other ways other online learning opportunities and so we did in the course of these webinars this spring also launch a new cal sci app essentials online course that's self-paced and it's on building background and comprehensible input. And we have these other topics as well on literacy development and an introduction to SIAP. So if you're interested in more self-paced asynchronous courses over the summer, I would encourage you to check those out. You do get a certificate for the, the hours or about five to six hour courses um, with some application activities. And then we're looking forward to a different experience rather than our face-to-face -face, um, online or our face-to-face -face training of trainers sessions. This summer we're offering uh, the SIAP training of trainers, both the foundations and advanced coaching. Some of you participated in those in the past in our face-to-face -face sessions. And we're moving them online and uh, looking forward to working with our cohorts and thinking about not just our SIAP content, but also best practices in online learning and instruction, um, as well as the professional development that many people may be doing virtually in the fall. And then Spanish literacy, it's really exciting. We have two offerings uh, in July as well, and one will be in Spanish, one week will be in Spanish, and one week will be in English on developing Spanish language and literacy skills. So if you have any questions about those, you can email or any of the above or any of the activities we presented you can email us at solutions at cal.org and then we can triage those out to the uh, best respondent. And as we said, these uh, handouts and a recording of this webinar uh, will be provided at this Cal resources page. It's right on our cal.org page in, in terms of resources. There's a drop down tab for free resources. Hi everyone, enjoy your summer until we meet again.